Uh, again, my name is Hyomin Kim, uh, pro 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 he's a professor at NGIT, working with, uh, very closely with Nathaniel Frisell. Um, so here I'm going to talk about magnetometer. Uh, probably I'm the only one uh, uh, who doesn't really do ham uh, stuff directly. Uh, I'm, I do mostly uh, data analysis for magnetospheric physics uh, using uh, data sets from satellite and ground-based magnetometer magnetometers. Also, uh, I've been in, uh, involved in development and installation of uh, many ground uh, magnetometer systems for um, uh, space science research. So I'm going to share my experience uh, and to propose a uh, uh, magnetometer system as part of a space weather package for HAMSI project. So um, it's been, uh, since this is not my uh, officially funded project, so it's been going a little bit slowly, so there's no really big progress since the last year, uh, but um, we, thankfully we now have uh, internal funding and we have uh, a couple of students that work with us, so, uh, so we are actually picking up the speed. So I think hopefully we can see more progress since now, than, uh, from now on. So, so magnetometer, uh, is one of the critical instruments for space science studies. So I don't really see any uh, instrumentation that does not include magnetometer uh, for space science. So that's very critical. Uh, the, for example, like spacecraft always has a boom and then magnetometer on top, uh, on the end. Can I use the, use the pointer? Um, and as you can see, uh, some fancy ground-based uh, observatory to measure magnetic field precise me measure for precise me measurement. Um, basically, magnetometers measures uh, magnetic field background, or DBDT, which is time-varying uh, component of it, uh, in, or, uh, in vector or end uh, scalar uh, quantity. And it has, uh, the good thing about magnetometer has really wide application, uh, metal detection, non-contact switch, non descriptive testing, oil, coal, uh, coal exploration, military, space science. So if you happen to fail uh, measurement or using magnetometer, then just you guys can use some or something else if you want <laughs> to find your coin or jewelry in the backyard. Or <laughs> Anyways, goal. Our goal is to establish a densely spaced magnetic field sensor network to observe Earth magnetic field uh, variations. Uh, target performance level is about, I would say, uh, tens of nanotesla field resolution at about one second uh, time cadence. Uh, you know, uh, the Earth magnetic field ranges between uh, 25,000 to 65,000 nanotesla, so you know how small the field is. Uh, at a professional level, or if you do it for scientific uh, studies, uh, the usually the, the resolution is a key factor, by the way, um, is actually sub nanotesla level, like 0.1 or even picotesla level. But we don't really uh, uh, try that, like really fancy magnetic field uh, uh, observation right now. Uh, time varying field measurement is sufficient. So you don't really have to know the background background. Uh, absolute measurement is not necessary. Although, uh, of course, it is very challenging to do it anyways. So how much the magnetic field changes, that's actually sufficient for our project. Uh, again, so why do we propose a uh, magnetometer? Uh, first of all, it is one of the critical instruments for space science research, space weather research. And data acquisition handling is relatively straightforward, um, especially for ground-based observations because uh, they are stationary. If you're talking about satellite measurement, that's a to whole completely different story. Uh, it is affordable, uh, off-the-shelf, you can off-the-shelf options are available. Uh, and if we want, we can go to this route, uh, like completely home, uh, in-house, homebrew type of design fabrication. That's also possible, but uh, I'm going to propose something more simple uh, that we can do right away. So it'll be a great opportunity for citizen scientists uh, and space science weather community. Uh, so uh, Ethan Miller actually briefly mentioned this. Uh, the one of the, one of the uh, project that APL, Johns Hopkins does, is actually called Ampere Project. Uh, 
active magnetosphere planetary electrodynamics response experiment using the, the iridium industrial uh, level satellite to measure this type of magnetic field disturbances. Uh, initially, the, um, the iridium satellite uh, wasn't designed to measure or uh, do any scientific investigation, but it was actually, it has um, uh, attitude uh, magnetometer for attitude information, but NSF actually, uh, and APL uh, proposed to uh, to use that for scientific investigation. This is, so I'm actually uh, giving this example uh, because what we're going to do could be pretty similar to what uh, they already did. So if you see the movie, they used a constellation of uh, iridium satellite to measure uh, magnetic field variation to infer current uh, is going in and out, uh, current level uh, over uh, the, uh, the Earth. So because of the current system is actually very much connected to the solar wind and magnetosphere. So this is very good example to, to use leverage uh, industrial uh, commercial uh, uh, level uh, infrastructure to study uh, real science. Uh, and the other example that I frequently use is a sort of a Google map kind of stuff. So what you provide using your cell phone is very simple data, basically location and your speed. But collectively, you can uh, infer traffic situation condition. So what we are trying to do is not to make any fancy measurement. We, we are trying to do is to provide very uh, simple, uh, easy to do measurement, but we want to do it collectively to map this kind of uh, big picture kind of uh, observation. So uh, that's our goal, and uh, that's w uh, that's, that explains why we want to do magnet magnetometer. Uh, I'd like to do this very briefly. So the space, the space weather, the, when you look at the Earth and magnetic field, magnetic field is very much connected to the solar wind activity. So if you look at magnetic field variation on the, on the ground, you can actually infer what's going on in the space. So that's why, that's why uh, it is important to look at uh, ground level uh, fluctuation of magnetic field. Then you can actually look at uh, what's going on in space. Uh, mainly because magnetic field uh, is very much affected by the solar wind. The solar wind pushes magnetic field or stretches magnetic field. It opens up the magnetic field, and there are a lot of uh, inter uh, interesting physics uh, uh, involved in this process, uh, 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 affecting particles and plasma in space, uh, and causing waves and uh, large-scale uh, current system in the in the ionosphere. So. The, because of the complex system uh, that connects between the Earth ionosphere and all the way to uh, solar wind and sun, solar surface, uh, that can contribute to understanding of uh, geospace system. And uh, so, the one of the very well-known uh, space weather-related uh, uh, event was actually 1989 when we when uh, the entire Quebec, Quebec uh, province actually had a, had a blackout due to uh, the explosion of the, uh, uh, the uh, power uh, uh, transformer. Uh, even, I think this is, uh, the, the, even the, uh, the power uh, transformer in New Jersey actually had an uh, explosion due to this uh, space weather re uh, related event. So if that happens, it can be really ca uh, catastrophic. So that's why uh, it is important to understand uh, what's uh, the, the, the behavior of geomagnetic activity. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, cartoons that shows why we care about this uh, uh, geomagnetic activity. One of the things is that uh, because of the, the infrastructure on the ground, it can have geomagnetically induced current on the ground uh, caused by this uh, geomagnetic storm. Uh, so it can actually uh, uh, affect the, uh, the hum human infrastructure uh, adversely. Uh, how do we measure on the ground? Basically, there's a huge current system that is actually caused by the magnetic field uh, around the Earth, which is connected to solar wind and, and sun, and uh, that current system uh, induced the magnetic field around the ionosphere 
that can be detected on the ground. So basically, Ampere circuit law. One example, during 1989, dramatic storm, you can see these are th this data is from Ottawa and Canada, and this is Fredericksburg, Virginia. So you can see the level of the change. This is really huge uh, uh, variation, basically, so almost uh, more than 1,000 nanotesla level. Uh, that's very, very big. Mostly the mi mi minor uh, storm is usually the order of 100, but this is like 1,000, more than 1,000 nanotesla change. And what's more important is how fast the change. So DBDT, which can be uh, calculated very easily from this raw data. If you look at the, the correlation, uh, these are from cannot even pronounce properly, Inuk, Inuk Shrock in, in Quebec, Canada data. Uh, the, uh, the magnetic field variation is actually very well correlated with uh, unwanted uh, harmonic distortion in the uh, Hydro-Quebec uh, power plant system. Um, so this type of thing, the big magnetic storm or big change in magnetic field can uh, cause some problems in the power system. And that's why we call it space weather, and this, that's why we want to know uh, what's going in space. That shows the, uh, uh, the pro-level magnetometer stations in over the place, in, uh, in the entire uh, uh, world. And if you look at all these dots, the white dots shows the, uh, uh, the stations that are not operational. Only the red dots are the ones that are operational. Uh, if you zoom into the, the U.S., then you can see a lot of empty spaces and uh, non-operational stations. So the spacing is wide. So uh, our goal is to make more dense array to see what, what we can do. So I have a table that uh, shows the comparison between the pro-level magnetometer array that is funded by uh, the government or Hamside Magnetometer Array. So basically, installation is, uh, is, is the pro, uh, the, the magnetometers are usually uh, located in designated observatories. Uh, you have to make sure that the buildings are completely non-magnetic, uh, in a, located in a il completely el electromagnetically clean area, so you have to uh, find very good locations, uh, versus your background, uh, your backyard basically, uh, Sorry, New Yorkers. Uh, apartment is not a desirable place. So <laughs> at least I want you to have some decent yard. <laughs> I don't want to put the magnetometer, I don't know, in a, in a basement garage or parking garage or something like that. Uh, cost is very expensive, of course, as you can imagine. And uh, yeah, for your mortgage or rent, and as long as you have any you have a house, yard, that's, and then I would expect a little bit of, a couple of hundred do uh, dollars to buy magnetometers. Uh, performance requirements, sub nanotesla resolution, uh, mo usually 0.1 nanotesla vector measurement, or sometimes they use picotesla level scalar measurement for absolute measurement or calibration of this magnetometer. Uh, we are going to shoot for, you know, more crude level, 10-ish uh, nanotesla level resolution. Uh, spacing, as you can see, is very spaced, uh, whereas we want to make it more dense. Um, the challenges of the, uh, the pro-level uh, magnetometer arrays is largely funding dependent, and some of the stations are not operational because of funding and because of many different problems. Accessibility and maintenance is another issue. Most of the stations are located in, in remote area. So it is hard to get there. Internet is a problem. Local staff, you know, here securing local staff is, uh, is a challenge. Vandalism, including wild animals, and sometimes people just uh, steal, uh, uh, steal stuff from... That was actually happened to one of our stations. Uh, people didn't uh, have anything to do, so they just stole a cable. Uh, <laughs> uh, the challenge of the Hamsai uh, magnetometer array would be uh, due to uh, the how and where uh, the sensor is installed. Like, you don't, we don't want to install magnetometer in a very electromagnetically uh, busy area, or, or uh, you have to make sure that uh, the magnetometer is properly uh, orient oriented. So we are going to provide some 
like nice, well documented uh, pro protocol to make sure that people follow the direction. So I'm we we came up with uh, three magnetometers that could be uh, the candidate magnetometer. So one is actually a uh, magnetometer that uses AMR technology, and isotropic magnetoresistive. Uh, it's actually Honeywell, uh, uh, the manufacturer is Honeywell, but they provide only the sensor itself. The sensor itself, I think, I believe, like less than $10. It's really small, very cheap, but you have to have uh, proper circuitry. Uh, without uh, proper circuit design, you cannot really reach the uh, resolution level that they actually claim. So I just uh, got a sample from uh, this university where they uh, make the the full package of magnetometer. Uh, it is supposed, supposedly just plug and play, so it comes with USB cable that is connected to the computer, um, uh, so that uh, it comes with a software package, so you can just use right away. Uh, it's about 250 US dollar, uh, providing what they claim is six, six nanotesla resolution, and this is uh, the sensor that actually University of Michigan. I don't know if they are here. The students will be showing the demo tomorrow. Uh, uh, it's a little bit more, a little bit, uh, more crude, but uh, it's cheaper. It has a digital output, so you can actually connect this to maybe Arduino or Raspberry Pi. We are actually working on it. Uh, I think Michigan Group has already built a one full package. The other one is Fluxgate. Uh, it's a German company providing better resolution, but it's more expensive, 400 euro uh, sensor only, and analog output, so you have to have data acquisition system. And I'm going to show this tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's still a prototype level, but it's, it's working. So these are the type of magnetometer that I'd like to propose. So open discussion. So nobody has done that before. And what happens if you have dense array with a little bit crude level? I mean, I believe that collectively can provide very, inform you know, very useful information, just like Google Map, you know, what uh, uh, just like I mentioned before. Uh, of course, the important thing is what type of science can we do, uh, especially in the middle latitude and low latitude around uh, the US? Uh, what's the uh, optimized spacing between your backyard and my backyard? And you know, what's the space? Uh, how do we uh, come up with good sensor performance? Resolution, what would be se resolution, sensitivity, noise level? Uh, how do we uh, install this sensor to avoid all these problems. Uh, how do we co uh, come up with the, uh, the EMI, uh, EMI issues? So all these type of things can be dis have, have to be discussed properly to make sure that we actually provide sort of uniform data set to uh, central uh, data repository. So that's all I have. So hopefully we can talk more about this. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you. So the, of the sensors that you showed up there, it looks like most of them are relatively large and <clears throat> and not not like a trash can size. But the, the one in the middle looks okay. But what my question is 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 it reasonable to assume that w in a space weather station type system that we build that any of these could be mounted inside the box, or are they going to, especially with EMI considerations, are they going to have to be like in a remote location? Or so yeah. So this one is actually Ethernet cable. So I'm thinking the maximum length of Ethernet cable is about 100 feet. So I think 100 feet, I mean... It, but, but that would be required to do that then as opposed to... I mean, that would take care of the problem, but sure, it would, be, it would be much nicer to have one inside the box, but if that won't work, then because of the other yes, the equipment inside... Yes, the electronics has to be inside the box, but I think there has to be the cable, and then the, the sensor has to be outside Whoa. somewhere. Yeah, maybe you know, inside the trash can or something like that. Some type of basic solution. It's very interesting. The, the magnetometers that we're looking at, do they provide an output that is proportional to the B field or proportional to the first time derivative of no, the B field? No, proportional to the B field. So they have integrators on them to yeah, convert yeah, the yeah. induced voltage yes. into... Uh, is that accurate? I'm not so sure. I mean, the ac if you want to go accurate level, then 
these type of like tens of thousands, uh, tens of dollar range. Yeah, it's very not. difficult to, right, to right, calibrate right. that yeah. kind of instrument, but they but can be made very sensitive. Science research, we as long as we know the variation, we don't really have to know the background. A lot right. of actually scientists actually remove those background just to look at the variation. So as long as we can see the variation, we are fine. Good. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at magnetic fields. Uh, when I discussed this with a friend of mine, he, he, he said, has anybody been looking at telluric currents, measuring actual voltage at, you know, at, at separated grounds? He did this back in the 60s and said it was incredibly predictive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it requires a lot of space. You have to put your ground rods in hundreds of feet apart. But right. I think I also the, the level of sensitivity should be really high. Yeah. Yeah, well, they, they, were, they were measuring uh, things in the 1 to 10 hertz region and, uh, okay. and, okay. uh, and below, of course. Okay. And he said that they found that very useful data. Does that correlate with this, uh, these, you know, magnetic? I, I'm not so sure because the, I think the sensitivity level, we're talking about very different uh, sensitivity level, I think. The, within like tens of nanotesla range, I don't know if that can be shown in this data set. So. But it's interesting. Yeah, it, it is interesting uh, question. Is it possible to calibrate these things with some kind of a, a controlled current um, in a controlled coil so you could actually get uh, a better absolute reading? Well, these products are supposed, <laughs> supposed to be calibrated, but who knows, right? So, but we have, uh, yeah, actually you can buy not, not so expensive uh, the housing to put the, uh, where you can put sensor to uh, sort of de uh, de make the z uh, zero field inside. So you can actually calibrate, you can use it. Yeah, I've done that and then th this is known technology. So we can do that. Yeah, I mean, we already did si studies back in Michigan about the total field or uh, flux gate. And it's really difficult to do something for the, for the backyard. But how about to have a Total, I mean, ma module magnetometer, simple, like you have on a, on a, on a car. And search coils, three-dimensional, small one, which you can actually convert value you measured by a total as a module to a directional vector. Think about that. That would actually be a solution to have it on the backyard. To accommodate the noise situation? Combining one module magnetic field total mm -hmm. plus three dimensional coil, search coil. In yeah, but search coil, one. I don't know if they can respond we can, to We this. can talk yeah, separately. I think motion, that's yeah. a okay. kind of promising okay. idea to make it something for citizen okay. science. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I'm running out of time, so thank you very much.